Okay, so I'm just going to set my pumpkin patch down here. Okay, all right. And we're going to uh, look into God's Word for this morning. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit more about light before we go too much further. Um, there's uh, light metaphors are all around in our world, aren't they? Um, and, you know, as you think about it, light is incredibly important and powerful, too. Um, and think about people throughout time, throughout history. Uh, they'd look at the moon and the stars and the sun, and, and just different peoples would even, like, worship the stars and the sun, because, well, this stuff keeps, keeps us alive. I guess we better worship it, huh? <laughs> um, and then people talk about in philosophy, right, about enlightenment, being enlightened um, in that whole era. And uh, I guess you could say light is just kind of fun to play with, too. And, you know, you think about kids and making little, you know, little shadow puppets. You know, remember in, in the science classes when they start those projectors going? Sorry, I'm dating myself here a little bit. <laughs> Everybody would want to put a hand up and make the little hand puppet, right? And then they'd get in trouble, and, you know, that's, that would happen. But, uh, um, and then all the imagery of light in that crazy, you know, fabulous, you know, movie series like Star Wars, and you've got lasers and lights and all these things. It's just everywhere, all these different metaphors, aren't they? And so I wanted to just start us thinking about light, and even like my question of the day said, uh, what do you do to brighten your day or evening when the seasons change and the days are darker? What do you do? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you think about that with me for a minute as I I'll see if we got any answers to, que to the question yet, and if some of you want to shout out anything that you do that you like to do to brighten it up around your house, anything that you normally do. Anyone? Turn all the lights off so you can see the stars. Turn all the lights off so you can see the stars and just gaze out on the stars. And it gets dark. <laughs> okay, so somewhere you got to go to bed too early. Got it. Okay, here's a few. Uh, Kelly, she's always a good one to answer. She says, to brighten my life on darker days, I open all the blinds and let the sun shine in. I also light lamps throughout the house in the evening for a warm, happy glow. Yeah. Uh, Jono said, when the days get darker, I play more tennis, especially in January. You, so you got an indoor court that you play at? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Or you could go to an outdoor lit court, but it's pretty cool. Okay. January is tennis season. I didn't know that. Uh, Teresa McGuire said, I crochet lots. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bonnie Canary said, we build a fire and watch Broadway shows on TV. Yeah, that fire. I'll show you a picture of one of my fires recently. Neat. Uh, Don Nair, change decor and menu for the season with gratefulness and in fun, cheerful ways. So you just kind of decorate your house up. On uh, Hillary, we keep Christmas lights up in our bedroom window all year long. They brighten the dark autumn nights. Good one. Good one. Yeah, and lights are, are everywhere. I know that this is a picture that I just took uh, the other day. I was down at Cannon Beach, had to get a little fall surf session in, and uh, kind of cooler, you know. So afterwards, you want to light a fire and just uh, stay warm at the beach there and uh, the, the clouds and everything coming in. But um, all these images and all these thoughts, right? Light is important, always has been for people of all times and places. And as we've looked already for today in our Bible reading, I'm going to read now from John 8. Jesus is the light of the world. With Jesus as our guide, we walk in the light. And so I'm going to start by reading that passage. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to that, you sure can. Again, from John 8, uh, verses 12 through 20. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men are valid. I am one who testifies for myself. The other witness is the Father who sent me. And they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. 
Yet no one sees him because his time had not yet come. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to share with you some of the context of this conversation and when it was going on. It's, it's going on during a, uh, this annual event, you could say it was kind of like a, a tent party time that was called the Feast of Booths. It had other names too, I'll share in a moment. But it was basically a fall camp out for God's people and really a celebration of God's deliverance. It was a time to remember, a time to remember, a time to remember. And we'll look to the Leviticus passage in a moment. And what were they remembering? They were remembering when uh, in Exodus 13, we read about the Lord went ahead of God's people after the Exodus and they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. The Lord provided for them physically and it provided a light, a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And, and at night, a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. That's Exodus 13:21. So they remember that Exodus time and that in the wilderness, God's providing, provided that light. And then annually, they would camp out in tents and remember how their ancestors had trusted in God's guidance and his provision in the wilderness for those 40 years. It's just fascinating to think about the meaning behind some of these uh, annual events and celebrations. And in Leviticus 23 is where the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites on a specific day, these seven days live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths or tents, tabernacles. These words are kind of interchangeable. So your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths or tents when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Moses announced to the Israelites the appointed feasts of the Lord. And so here's a couple of pictures, kind of, again, feast of booths. See the little tent there, kind of, again, even to this day, people do this. And the next picture, also called uh, Sukkot. Sukkot, I think is the right way. Sukkot, <laughs> uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would build these structures, usually had one opening, and then branches on top, just as it's written about in the Bible. And then here's some even um, very observant, obser observant Jews that build these little temporary uh, booths or shelters to live in, remembering again how God had delivered them. And uh, I think there's one more, perhaps. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's really fascinating to think about all that happened. And uh, there's a Jewish writing called the Mishnah about 200 AD that told more about what to do at this big celebration. And uh, they lit these huge candelabras. You can see there, there's, a, there's one of the young priests, the rookie priests, I think, would have to climb up these 75-foot ladders. No, no joke. And fill them with huge amounts of oil. And then just light up the place like, like amazing a light that would just fill the whole courtyard. Not a, it was said there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated by the light of the place, right? And then, and then everybody else would get a little fire torch too. So I mean, this is like, I mean, just kind of blew my mind to think about. So all these torches, these tall torches, are lit up, and then everybody else gets their own handheld torch, okay? <laughs> and then they dance, and they have this holy music festival. Big fair, lots of trumpets and noise uh, till the break of dawn. All this was going on. All this fabulous celebration, God's people doing what they were called to do. And in the middle of all of this, Jesus stops and says, I am the light of the world. Isn't that powerful to think about all this imagery and all this importance of what God had done and what was observed and remembered? And then Jesus is around all these Pharisees, religious people, others. I am the light of the world. And he continues then in this passage that I just read to testify about himself. And uh, this imagery that John writes about is powerful. We read earlier in, in John chapter 1, when we first started this series in the Gospel of John, we read about Jesus, the Word become flesh, who had come into the world. And one of those reminders from John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And you see that again, the light shining, even in this passage here that we just read. And Jesus was being questioned, wasn't he? By people who did not and refused to really see and receive who Jesus was. And he's being 
is being questioned and the people are missing the point. We see in verses 12 and 13 as he spoke that beautiful promise, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. And then right away, the Pharisees, Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And, you know, it's kind of like, like this banter. These, and these kids, kind of the Pharisees, kind of like, no, you can't say that. You can't say that. You, know, you have to have two witnesses. And just, they're totally missing the point. And Jesus speaks. Uh, and as he says these words and they reply back, uh, basically Jesus continues to say, yes, I know, I, I know I'm making some very big claims, but I'm not making them on my own, right? And he talks about he and the Father uh, being one. And uh, if you go back to John chapter 5, we didn't highlight this passage in, uh, in, our, uh, in our study and, and series so far yet. But uh, you can see in John chapter 5, beginning with about verse 31, okay, Jesus admits, right, in, our, in the law, you cannot just be the only witness, right? There's got to be other testimonies about oneself, kind of like we see a lot of times in the law, right? And one, there's got to be other, other people backing it up. And uh, he had said in John 5, 31, if I testify about myself, okay, right, my testimony is not valid. If there is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. And so he continues to speak about all the, the witnesses. And he goes on to list the witnesses of, of, uh, that testify uh, to Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus' miracles, God the Father, the Holy Scriptures, testify to the truth of Jesus' claims. And that first witness that's, that's spoken about in John 5 is John the Baptist that testified to him. Uh, Jesus' miracles themselves testify to him that he had already performed. Uh, the voice of God uh, affirming that this was his beloved, Jesus was God's beloved son. And then the witnesses of all the scriptures uh, and the prophecies, the words that have been written already uh, concerning Jesus. And so witnesses, you need two? Well, there's even more here, many more witnesses. And uh, and he even said, well, I could even bear witness to myself because basically I'm God. Pharisees are missing the point, and I guess you can understand that. They're looking from this human perspective. How can, how can this one person that we're learning about and we're finding out about, how can he say all these things? And it's the, the depth of Jesus and who he was, fully human, in Hebrews 2, 17, we read Jesus was made like us in every way. Yet we continue to read Jesus was yet fully God. Perfect. Made like us, but yet perfect without sin. And Jesus goes on to say then in, in verse 19, You don't know me or my Father. And as that passage concludes, the, we see that Jesus is not yet arrested. As we see his time had not yet come. So God is the one that's creating the timetable here. It's not man. It's not the Pharisees. It's no one else other than, than, than God himself. And we see Jesus being sovereign even in his own death that led to his resurrection and eternal life. As we look at this passage and this powerful imagery, um, I want us to think back to the... Israelites, okay? Think about how they were led by that cloud by day and that fire by night, right? Guiding them, leading them every step away in spite of their sometimes obedience, oftentimes disobedience. And to think about Jesus, uh, the source, the light, the source of life, and are you following the light of the world? Are you walking in the light and focused on his promises? And that promise, again, he's our salvation and our guide throughout life. Right? He is God with us. So we really shouldn't think we're much different than the people of Israel uh, that we read about in the Old Testament. The people even that were interacting with Jesus during this time that when Christ was here on the earth doing his ministry. 
But uh, like Israel, we've gotten, our, we've gotten ourselves into an interesting and sad predicament. And it isn't Pharaoh's army, perhaps, that's chasing after us as they were when they were led out of Egypt. But it's really death itself, isn't it, that's chasing us. One, I've quoted this uh, author that says, you know, we're slowly breathing to death in our sins. That's the gravity of sin, and the sin that causes death. And in the midst of this, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Right, right when we are dying, Jesus brings this reminder, I am the light of the world. Okay, so we live here in the Northwest, and uh, I think some people are affected by the darker days that I've referenced already, right? You've, you've all heard this, uh, I think, sad seasonal affective disorder, right? And I think different people are impacted differently. I think I, I uh, <clears throat> make up for it by trying to get up to the mountains as often as I can in the winter, because you get above the clouds and you get into the bright snow, <laughs> the snow shine, <laughs> I guess I'd say it, and you get some of that vitamin D going and everything. Can you attest to that? That's kind of those nice escapes that we can get out of the clouds and gloom. But um, we all need light. We all need that vitamin D. I've even heard that these days more than ever. Yeah, get, come on, get all these good nutrients you can get, including sunshine, as often as you can. And um, um, our soul, our hearts need the light that only Jesus can provide. Amen? Our hearts need that the ministry that Christ can do can, can fill us only. You try to fill it with other things, good luck. The only source of light, the only source of life, is Jesus, the one who died, who rose again on the third day so that we can be brought into the light of God. And yes, we're sinners, we're broken, but thanks be to God that Jesus' blood covers us. We're going to have communion in a few moments, and as you come up to the table to receive the, the bread and the juice, and remember again, Jesus' body that was broken, his blood was poured out for us. We remember, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Your blood covers me. And we receive him in faith. It's like a, you know, twice a month altar call that we have to come to Jesus. Put it all at the foot of the cross. He can, his, sin, his, his death and resurrection covers you and covers me. We can walk into God's presence because we're covered with Christ. And that leads us to remember these promises. We speak about them regularly, weekly, because we need to remember. And our, God's word is a lamp to my feet, a light for my path. We recall these timeless truths from Scripture, and we remember it. We are called to interact with God's word. That is our lamp to our feet, our light to our path. And he's given us this precious gift written down that we can know how to live and respond throughout all that life brings. And God is so good. You see that gift? God is so good. He wants to give us the good things that we need so that we can live and not just exist or be slowly breathing to death. God is so good. I'm going to ask kind of a personal question uh, right now, but uh, how good is your memory? <laughs> how good is your memory? Ah, oh, man. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I didn't even have to ask Mike to do this. He just tries to, what was the question? Yeah, right. Where was I again? Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so the other day, I was getting a bunch of different things ready, getting ready to get out the door, and I was filling a small uh, cooler with some ice, and I thought about, oh, ice, ice maker in the freezer's broken. Before I leave, I should probably fill up with the bag of ice. I should fill up the, the freezer so the dispenser can work, you know. You know the drill, or maybe not, but that's our drill. <laughs> so I, I get the ice bag out of the freezer in the garage, fill up my little cooler, and just set the bag on the floor. Okay, I'll remember that. Yeah, I'll remember that. I'll remember that. And then I get my other things ready, and then I'm, and then I'm off. And, of course, I don't think about that until I get home. And my wife says, did you leave something out? Of the and I go, yep, guilty. <laughs> And that bag, fortunately, it hadn't exploded and made a huge puddle all over the garage floor, but it was just a nice cold bag of water. <laughs> um, but memory, right? 
Um, and we are prone to forget. We forget earthly things. We forget people's names. We forget you name it. What's your most worst favorite often thing to forget? Where my keys are. Why I came into a room. Do you know why you're here today, Jim? <laughs> okay, good. So we're prone to forget. And what has God given us? His word, though, right? To remind us. Remember, remember, remember. We're so blessed to have multiple translations of the Bible, audio Bibles, and, and we know there are places in the world where people are holding on to pages that maybe they were given of a Bible in some places where it's illegal to even have one, and they just, or they've memorized it. And so never take for granted the power of the Word of God to engage with the Word of God regularly. And another just uh, clear reminder uh, that, that if, as we seek to follow the light of the world, as we seek to focus on his promises, let's remember and receive the promise and the calling that Jesus has for us because he sends us out on a mission. He gives us guidance, he gives us his word, and then he tells us to go, right? And uh, I heard someone say this, they said, living in the light of God's love is not like just lying on a tanning bed just basking in the light, okay? If you've ever been in a tanning bed, you just sit there, right, and you bake. <laughs> Probably not real good for you, right? Well, uh, what does the light do? The light guides us to move. We follow him. We don't just sit passively. We want to receive it. We want to so soak it in, but then we go. Um, there's a kind of a popular phrase that was used a number of years ago, and, you know, it's okay. It's, it says something like, let go and let God. Well, uh, at the end of the day, our faith is not just letting go. It's an active faith. Right? God does his miraculous saving work in us, not of our own, by his grace alone, and then we're called to follow. Um, Matthew 5, 14 and 16 says this, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good <coughs> deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so we see this, this, this Jesus the light of the world. And people might think, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was the light of the world. And I, I thought, yeah, you're the light, Jesus. And well, Jesus kind of says this, just like we just sang about, well, okay, I am the light of the world and I've lit you on fire by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to go out and be my witnesses, to go out and make a difference in Jesus' name, that others would praise your Father in heaven. These, these days that we're in, we can all look at different things that we can be kind of outraged about in our world, right? And I would encourage you, okay, receive. We want, all want truth, and we want justice and good things to come for people's lives. But I think our make, we should make a concerted effort each day, not just to look at the, the darkness and the head shake. Oh, can you believe that's happening again and this is happening? Uh, but really look where you live. And uh, don't just live on the social media or, you know, virtual world, people pointing all these things out, but look where you live and can you identify some kind of darkness, maybe that's present even in your circle of influence, in your neighborhood, in your, in your family, okay? And seek to be the light of Christ, lighting up the room, lighting up the world right where you live. Because, yes, darkness and brokenness is everywhere. And I think it's a challenging thing these days, too, but it's, it's worth it to think about, okay, well, who are my neighbors where I live? And maybe you think, hmm, do I even know my neighbors? Many of you do, but maybe there's some that you don't. And how can you be on your heart to, to get to know them, to, to know their names, and to know what makes them tick? I had an amazing conversation with a neighbor that had just moved in, um, to our neighborhood a month or so ago, and we got to know him, and I was trying to remember, even when I saw him, I was going to talk to him, I go, oh, what's his name? You know, I forgot his name. I, I met him like a week or two ago, and then what did I do? I forgot his name, but we got to know each other and talk. Now I'm, now I'm, now I'm not going to ever forget his name, because we've had a, a d deeper conversation and talk about some things that are real, uh, real significant to both of us. But think about right where you're at, and uh, that's, that's, you and me been set on fire by Jesus to bring light, to
to any kind of darkness and any kind of dark place. And this man was going through a difficult time, so it was good to talk with him and, and pray with him. So as 1 Peter 2, 9 says, so I close with this verse, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen. Think about a few of these questions that you can just relate to and I hope struggle with, maybe wrestle with, uh, be encouraged by. But how is Jesus the light of your life? How have you experienced his protection, presence, and guidance? In what ways is Jesus calling you to walk in the light? Do you need more of God's word in your life? Is there sin that needs to be confessed? Someone you need to share the gospel with? And again, pray. Pray continually. Pray that Jesus would be our light. Pray that we would not seek salvation or guidance from anything else that competes, that tries to compete. There's nothing above him. And pray that we joyfully bear the light of Jesus to a dark and broken world, wherever that may be that God is calling you to go.